Welcome to Project Revelation. This is the first time that I ever saw entities. My eyes were closed, but I felt like I could see what was going on around me. And there was like 50 to 100 little, and this was a big, big bedroom, like really big bedroom, like 50 to 100 little uh, demons that looked kind of like Smeagol. Like that's the only way I could describe it, like the way they were walking, they were walking like bent down. More than 7% of the general population have experienced something called sleep paralysis. Some of the experiencers have seen entities and shadow creatures, all while not being able to move. Join me and my special guest, Jeremy Stone, as he tells his story. The nature of our reality is very strange. Have we been lied to? So I'm here with uh, Jeremy Stone, and I hear that you have an amazing testimony. And how are you doing today, Jeremy? I'm doing great, man. Thank you for thank you for having me on your show. And um, I'm excited, man. I'm hoping this is going to touch a lot of people because uh, I think there are people out there who don't really express or talk about their experiences because of how taboo it is. Or, you know what I mean? No one, they, they, people look at it like it's a like you're crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of people out there have these crazy experiences and they don't want to talk about it. Cause like you said, it's maybe, you know, the it's taboo or it sounds fantastic. Like, well, this does stuff like this doesn't really happen. But in my experience, I hear a lot of, a lot of crazy stuff, a lot of dark stories, but ultimately you know, Jesus gets the glory um, out of that. I always say, man, once the enemy starts to poke somebody, he's got to watch out because if the enemy's after him, that just means that Jesus is right there after them 10 times harder. So, so yeah, where do you want to start with the story? You, you can start wherever you'd like, Jeremy. Oh uh, yeah. I'll probably start from my childhood because uh, I think that um, trauma uh, has a lot to do with being attacked. You know what I mean? Like when you're somebody's broken down, they are so susceptible to the demonic and to being attacked. And I feel like most people who have been through a lot of trauma are those who suffer the most with spiritual attacks. I mean, everybody does, but you know what I mean? It seems like it's more intense with those who have gone through some, some pretty hard stuff. So, um, yeah, when I was a kid, um, my mom, and dad, they were not together uh, when I was born and my brother and stuff. So I lived with my mom for a short period of time. Uh, when I was two years old, she had a boyfriend and um, he was an alcoholic. He was 18 at the time. He was an alcoholic and he abused my brother and I and my sister um, physically. And uh, my mom didn't realize it until my mom had taken me to my grandparents one day and they were asking about all the bruises and I got my mom thought it was just all their boys you know they're just they get bruises they do stupid stuff you know what I mean but um a lot of it when I was growing up was blocked out so what happened was my grandparents ended up taking my brother and I and my sister when we were three years old they adopted us to the state and uh or else and the, the reason why they did that is because if we were put in an orphanage home they would have taken me and my brother and put us all of us in a separate home. So we would have never had a life together. And my grandparents didn't want that. Um, as I was growing up, my grandparents kind of released um, some of the events that happened to us when we were kids, because we didn't really remember. Your, your, your mind just blocks it out and uh, to try to protect you. And um, we would, my mom was always trying to like come back into her life to a degree and we would always defend her not you know just because she was our mom we didn't really know what happened to us at the time and so my grammy would start releasing some of the things that had happened uh when we were young when we were two years old um to kind of get us to realize hey like i took you guys in we provide everything and love you guys you know like you need to know the real story um, because you're growing up now you know what i mean 
And uh, you really need to hear what happened. So when we were young, <clears throat> this my mom's boyfriend was not my it was not my dad, um, but my mom's boyfriend at the time would uh, throw us down staircases. Um, he would uh, physically abuse us. He'd lock us in drawers if we wet the bed. Like, and I mean, like, like closed drawers and um, leave us in there for hours. And uh, at one point, he didn't want us around anymore. So he put us out in the middle of a swamp in the middle of a thunder and lightning storm while we were two years old and told us that if we wanted to live, that we'd have to walk home. So he left us in the middle of the swamp and we had to, I don't know what happened. I mean, I can't remember everything, but this is what my grandparents told me, at least in court. Um, so growing up, we had night terrors when we were around, I don't know, six or seven, you know, maybe a little bit younger from the time that we were like 13, when there was a thundering lightning storm, we'd be like, wake up screaming and be very afraid. And we didn't really know why. And then, you know, so my grandparents ended up telling us why, and because she wanted to figure out the problem. And, uh, so yeah, we went through all this trauma. My grandparents adopted us when we were three years old and they gave us everything, you know, they loved us mo more than we could have ever imagined, you know? And, uh, but my mom and dad were in and out of prison. So what would happen is when they were out of prison, we would spend a weekend with my dad. And then every other weekend we'd see my mom, you know what I mean? So we alternated on weekends and stay with my grandparents through the week. Uh, well, my dad was an alcoholic. And when I was like eight years old, I told him, Hey, like, you really got to stop drinking. Like I knew inside of me that him drinking that much was wrong. And I would hear my grandparents talking about it, you know? So being eight years old, you think that you wouldn't really understand that type of thing because you got other stuff going on. But like, I love my dad so much. And, uh, you know, he taught us how to play football and, uh, encouraged us to play sports. Like he, he, he loved us and he tried, uh, but his addiction was strong. And uh, one day I told him, Hey, like, if you don't stop drinking, I'm never going to see you again. And I told him that because I figured that would get him to stop drinking. I didn't realize the severity of addiction at eight years old, you know, but he tried, he went to a couple of different places to get this and that uh, to get his life figured out. And he was doing some other stuff on the side, I guess. But, um, on the next time I went to go visit him after saying that, uh, he was still drinking. So I had my grandparents pick me up. My brother and my sister stayed there and I went home and, uh, for the next couple of times that I went to go see him or that was our turn to go see him, I'd skip it. You know, I really wanted to know, Hey, you need to stop. And, uh, well, one day it was uh, shortly after school, my brother and sister went on the, their weekend to go visit him. And that Sunday, my grandparents would pick him up and I went with him. I really missed my dad. So, you know, I went with them to pick him up <clears throat> and uh, I could just see him sweating profusely in his chair. Like he was a big guy. He was, he was a big dude and he was sweating really, really bad. It just seemed like something was wrong. And uh, my grandparents looked at him and said, Hey, you look like you're not doing very well. Like, I think you should go to the hospital, you know? And, uh, I didn't think anything of it because, you know, men, dude, they don't, it's all that pride. Like, nah, I'm good, you know? So uh, I gave him a hug. I can just remember how much he was sweating, dude. Like, it was crazy. Like, as if the house was 100 degrees, but it wasn't, you know? He was just pouring sweat. Anyways, I picked up my brother and my sister and we left. And I was like thinking to myself, it was good to see him, you know? And next time, you know, I miss him. So next time I'll go see him. Well, that Monday, we had school. And my grandparents had taken us out of school early. You know, they showed up. And uh, when we got to the, to the office where they were picking us up, I just saw them crying. And I was like, oh, what's going on? Like, this is weird. You know what I mean? I couldn't figure out why they were upset or why they were pulling us out of school. And uh, when I got home, uh, they sat us down and they told us that uh, my dad had passed away in his sleep. And uh, I heard a couple different reasons of how he died. But um, as far as I know, he was mixing alcohol with drugs and, uh, or a sleeping pill or something. And uh, at the same time, his body wasn't healthy, so he was dealing with a blood clot. And, like he passed away in his sleep that night. 
the night that we left. And uh, this event in my life, like it took such a big toll on me, you know? I was so angry all the time and, and sad and hurt. And uh, my brother was too. And we were dealing with a lot of grieving and I felt like the grieving would never end. And uh, we were super, super angry at God. And I didn't know God, you know, I didn't know him at all. I just thought to myself, you know, if there's a God, like I hate you. I, and I took that anger in my life and I placed it all on him. I blamed him for everything. I purposely rebelled against him. Even if I didn't really know him, I thought if he was real, I'm going to do it anyway, you know. And uh, my brother and I dealt with anger issues, like severely growing up. We'd fight. We had the most brutal fights with each other, but we'd fight other kids and our household ended up getting like very stressful and uh, chaotic because we were angry about everything. And, you know, everything just seemed like out of control um, inside. And from that, it must have been like a couple months after my dad died and we're sitting there all messed up in the head and the heart. And uh, one night I went to sleep and I remember it for the first time. I remember it perfectly. I, I go to sleep and I just felt like this weird feeling coming on to me and I had no idea what it was. And I was like, oh, this is weird. So I like tried to stay up and try to kind of fight it because I didn't like the way I was feeling. And then I ended up just kind of giving up and trying to sleep. And I felt something heavy on my chest and I'm like consciously awake. Like I'm awake in my head and I know what's going on. I'm, I'm aware of what's going on around me, but I couldn't open my eyes. I just knew that I was awake and I had, it felt like some, somebody was sitting on my chest and uh, um, my brother and I used to share a room growing up. So I'm sitting there trying to call out for my brother and all that we dealt with was like air. Like I'm yelling in my head really loud, but like to try to speak it, all that would come out was air. That was it. And uh, so I'm struggling, I'm fighting. And it finally ends. I finally give up, pass out, wake up. And I told my brother about it. And he had the same experience that night. So that was... So, so that was that you, th that story that you just told where you you and your brother experienced at the same time, that was the first time you experienced the sleep paralysis that you can remember. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I didn't Oh, go on. Sorry. No, no go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I know a lot of people, um, everybody's sleep paralysis situation is a little different and a lot of people see entities or like, they'll say like, they call him the hat man. You know, like he's just this all black being like darker than the darkness of your room. You know what I mean? They can make out a figure. And we didn't really experience that until later on, because from that point forward, we suffered with this for three or four days out of the week for at least eight years, eight, nine years. My brother and I, after my dad died, it piqued us to think that there was there has to be something more to life. You know what I mean? There's got to be more than just living and dying. So at a very young age, you know, a little after eight years old, we were getting to the paranormal. We were getting into Ouija boards and, you know, aliens and like all this crazy stuff. We just were kind of out there seeking the truth. Like what is the truth of life? Like what really exists and what doesn't? And um, a lot of those, like we were kind of on the path for the truth. That's all we cared about. And we went down some bad pass like some wrong roads for sure and uh my brother and i would uh get into the ouija board and all of a sudden we'd start seeing things that night we went to bed because we were trying to contact my dad that's all we cared about so you know we would be like, hey you know and i don't re recommend this to anybody obviously the ouija board is just a gateway but we'd ask the board or whatever to try to contact my dad and sometimes it would reply, but in my head, I'm like thinking to myself, oh, that was just you like moving the board. You know what I mean? I didn't really think anything of it. I didn't really believe it at first. And, um, but one night my dad, uh, or my, my uncle, my dad's brother and my, my cousin went to go clean out my dad's apartment after he had died. And they found a Ouija board in his house. Hmm. 
And so my uncle was like, hey, I don't want you touching that. I got to go do this and that. I don't want you touching that, you know, throw it away or whatever. Well, when he left, he was in his car and my, my cousins pulled out the Ouija board and they tried to contact my dad. And it replied back, uh, tell Timmy not to cry. My uncle's name is Timmy, right? On the board, it spelled out, tell Timmy not to cry. And they were like, what? So they called my uncle. And sure enough, he's sniffling and he's crying. And they told him, hey, you know, uh, Kevin told me that you were crying. And he was all upset about it because, you know what I mean? That he had just told him not to play with the Ouija board. And it ended up telling him something legit. You know what I mean? Like, and at that time I knew, okay, maybe the Ouija board is, really does work. You know, what are the chances? So we get into this, to the Ouija board quite a bit. And I ended up bringing it to my house and uh, keeping it with me so that if I felt grief, like if I was grieving or something or sad that day, I would try to, you know, bust it out and uh, try to contact my dad. We did that for a little bit. And uh, this whole time we were still experiencing sleep paralysis three, four days a week. And uh, I remember one of the, uh, one of the nights I was, so the way that my house was, you walk in through the front door and on the right is a staircase up to the up, up to the second floor. And it's a long hallway and there's a bedroom at the end of the hall. And then to the right of that is, um, what was my grandparents' room. And then when you first get up the stairs on your right is, uh, was my brother and I's room and we'd, we'd share. And every time we went, had to go to the bathroom, we would be petrified to go downstairs because it was pitch black. And the bathroom was like, downstairs in the way back of the house we'd have to walk quite a ways you know and uh in, in the dark so uh what we do is we just flip on the hallway light and kind of go downstairs and use the bathroom or whatever well one night i got up and i was like oh man like i really gotta use the bathroom so and i was nervous i turned on the light and i started to walk down the stairs and i kid you not dude at the bottom of the stairs i saw the devil like legit, I saw the devil. He was, the way that he looked, I don't know if you've ever seen um, Wishmaster. I don't know if you know what those movies are, but uh, they were horror movies. And, uh, but he was in that movie, he's like, he's kind of gray and slimy or whatever. But in this, he had the same complexion in my in real life that I saw, but he was red. He had the big horns and he just stared at me and just had this wicked evil smile just smiled slowly at me and i ran back up the stairs as fast as i could and i hopped in my bed and i'm thinking my my covers were going to protect me you know so i went under my covers and i just i just laid under there didn't look at anything didn't talk to nothing nobody didn't wake my brother up i just stayed there until i passed out and uh i woke up and i in the next morning and i told my brother what happened and he's like oh no you must have been dreaming and I was like, no, dude, I was, I was awake. Like I had to go pee. You know, I, I got up and I went to the bathroom. Like I remember this, I was completely awake when I saw this and he kind of brushed it off. So I kind of ended up keeping it to myself for a long time. Well, during, you know, all these years, my brother was bottling stuff up too of some of the things that he saw. Um, and I'll get into that in a little bit, but so one night I was in my bedroom you know, this is to another event. My brother and I ended up moving out of that bedroom and going to the end of the hall bedroom. And we had a bunk bed. So we, we set it all up in there. We lay down, you know, go sleep in there or whatever. And how, how um, old are you guys at this time? Uh, we're probably like eight. Uh, no, not eight. We're probably like 10 or 11 now. So you've been doing that. So at this point, you've been, how long have you guys been doing the Ouija board for? Uh, about, I'd say about a year and a half. Okay. Yeah. So about a year and a half. And uh, what was weird is they found the Ouija board at my dad's apartment. And he would tell us that he saw stuff all the time, but being a kid, you're just kind of like, whatever, like you don't really understand it. So, you know, uh, and we didn't know it was like probably connected board. So the Ouija board that was at my dad's house, um, my cousins ended up using. And after they used it, we ended up bringing it home. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, after some time, we ended up bringing it home when they cleaned up the apartment. So we were using the Ouija board for like a year and a half. And through that time, though, uh, 
when we were still like 11 years old, we ended up moving into a different bedroom. And uh, we, we would always sleep together. So he had the top bunk and I get the bottom bunk. Then every other night we'd switch. And we, my grandparents kept telling us, hey, like, why'd you sleep on the floor? Why'd you end up sleeping on the floor? And I'm like, I didn't sleep on the floor. And she's like, well, I heard you last night. And you were on the top bunk when I, when I went to go check on you, when you were sleeping, you were on the top bunk. But when I got up this morning, you were laying on the floor. And we were like, didn't, I was like, I don't remember, you know, getting up and laying on the floor or whatever. Well, I guess what was happening is my grandparents kept hearing these bangings too every night. And we kind of concluded that we were falling off the top, falling, I would say falling. And I'll tell you why I put it in quotations, but we ended up falling off the top bunk almost every single night. Every time we switched, one of us would fall off the top, very top of the bunk and end up on the floor. Well, we didn't know what was going on. Like, oh, maybe you're sleepwalking or whatever, you know, like I didn't have any bruises. I didn't feel like I was hurt. You know what I mean? It was almost kind of like somebody had placed me on the floor. And one night I'm sleeping on the top bunk and I'm starting to have this feeling again, like the sleep paralysis feeling. I ended up after a while, kind of knowing when it was coming on, because I would get this like pre feeling about it, you know what I mean? And I would just give up and I'd fall asleep and all of a sudden, or not fall asleep, but I would just kind of give up and all of a sudden I couldn't, my eyes, I couldn't speak, I couldn't yell for help. And I'm awake and I can't figure out what's going on. And uh, I remember 100%, I told my brother about this a long time ago, but somebody one night, took me off of the bed and like put me over their shoulder and I'm awake. I just can't open my eyes enough to see what's going on. And my eyes are flickering, like trying to open them really hard because uh, I, I just couldn't do it. And I knew that somebody was taking me off the bed. Well, we get, somebody takes me off the bed, starts walking down the, the hallway. And when I get to the top of the stairs, I open my eyes just enough to look down and I didn't see any legs. I didn't see any legs at all. So I had no idea who was taking me off this bed, right? And they started bringing me downstairs and walking me through my living room towards the bathroom in the back of my house. And I'm fighting this whole time, like any way that I can to wake up or to yell or just ask for help. And, you know, like again, all that would come out was like breath. And we get to the kitchen and I just gave up. I gave up and I was like, and I just passed out. And when I woke up, I was back on the floor in my bedroom in the morning. And I get up and, I, and I'm telling my brother about this and I go and ask my grandparents, hey, like, did you try to bring me down to the bathroom? Because when I was a kid, I had a small bladder. So I would like, you know, wet the bed a lot or whatever. So I thought that then maybe they had taken me down to go to the bathroom. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that I wouldn't wet the bed. And like, kind of like, my, maybe, maybe my grandfather just threw me over his shoulder and tried to walk me down there to mm -hmm. have me go to the bathroom or whatever. They didn't touch me. <laughs> they had no idea what was going on. And so after that night, my brother and I were like, hey, dude, like I'm, I, I told him, I'm dealing with this sleep paralysis a lot. I didn't say it was sleep paralysis, but whatever was going on with me, you know, I kind of explained it the best way I could. And I said, can you watch me while I sleep? And if you see me gasping for air, or you, you see me trying to struggle or move or whatever, I was like, you need to wake me up. And so from that point on, him, my brother and I would take turns watching each other. A lot of the times we just ended up falling asleep, but you know, <laughs> but we, we, we took turns watching each other because we were both struggling with the same thing. And um, I remember that eventually we got rid of the bed bug, uh, the, the bed bugs, the, um, the bunk beds and we ended up getting two separate beds in the same room and it, I put my bed on one side of the wall and he put his bed on the other side of the wall on the opposite side at the end of our bedrooms you know if that makes you can picture that um, we had just got done watching um, this was probably when we were like 13 at this point but we were watching uh, ghost hunters that uh, show on TV mm -hmm. and uh, we got really into that we were always like dude let's go try to 
how it goes or whatever. Uh, we need to warm, warm world or let's get, you know, some some equipment and, and go off to scary places and haunted houses and all this stuff. I was like, because at that point we believed in the, uh, we believed in ghosts. We didn't know that what they were, you know, we didn't know they were demons, but we believed there, there was ghosts and stuff. And uh, anyways, one night we get done watching TV and we go to lay down in our bedrooms and we had this idea like, hey dude, let's just call out for dad. You know, like in our bedrooms, I was like, let's just pray and see if he responds. And so we're laying there in our bed. He's in his bed, I'm in my bed. And uh, I'm like, hey dad, like if you're there, can you please just say one of our names? And we waited and we waited and I asked a couple times. Well, eventually we're like on the brink of falling asleep. So I asked one more time, hey dad, can, can you just say one of our names to let us know that you're here with us? And then on the brink of falling asleep, we hear, both of us hear from the dead center of our room, somebody whispered, Josh, just like that, Josh. And me and him both sat up and started screaming. We were like freaking out. And then we went and grabbed our grandparents and we we're telling them what's happened. And they're just like, oh no, you must've been dreaming or whatever. So they totally played it off because they couldn't understand what was happening. But both of us were awake. We both heard it all sat up at the same time and just freaked out about it. It was, it was pretty insane. I also had this cat pillow that my dad had given me when I was a kid. So I kept it with me for a long time after he died. You know, I'd bring it to my friend's houses or whatever when I was kind of growing up. It was kind of like a comfort thing. And, um, well, we have a sister that, that my dad had a child with another woman at one point. And she's old. She's like two years older than us. And, we didn't really know her, but we ended up connecting. And my brother and I went to go hang out with her for like the first time since we were like very young, because I didn't even remember, like remember her. And um, we're at her house and I'm bringing in this pillow. And then we started getting into this conversation about cologne. My dad loved cologne, right? And for even to this day, I, I still try to find the one that he had because it smells so good and it's just kind of like a remembrance thing, you know what I mean? So I would spend so much money on cologne to try to find the right one. And uh, I'm sitting there telling my sister about how I remember dad's cologne and the way that he smelled. And uh, we were just got into that conversation. It was kind of short, but I went to lay down on my pillow that my dad gave. And it smelled just like my dad, like this, like somebody had just sprayed it, sprayed it on my pillow. No joke. And I like take it and I'm freaking out. I'm like, this is it. I was like, I don't know what's going on, but this is it. Like smell my pillow. So like I passed it around and they were like, yeah, that's exactly what he smells like. And that was just another weird, unexplainable thing that happened. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. So, so, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned before and, um, you know, just about trauma and all of those things, you know, of how that opens up a door for all of this. And then, you know, it seemed like your dad had opened up a door previous with the Ouija board and you guys just kind of followed suit. Um, so what, so where, where do you want to go now? Do you want to talk about the, about how you came to Jesus or is there any more like uh, stories about that? Probably around 13 or 14 years old, my brother really, and I really got into like the paranormal and aliens and searching for the truth. Like I had mentioned earlier. Yeah. And uh, this went on for a couple of years. And during this time, we were still experiencing sleep paralysis. But what was weird is that like, it happened more when we were at home. And we had, after a while, we forgot about the Ouija board that we even had. It was just stuffed in a closet, you know? And, uh, but things were really amping up. And it was getting weird, but every time we left the house and slept over a friend's house, it wouldn't happen. So we'd love to go sleep over at a friend's house because it just wasn't happening. My brother and I would literally stay up for two, three days at a time because we were petrified of going to sleep because we knew what was going to happen, you know, if we went to go to sleep, that, that sleep process would come upon us and we'd have these crazy dreams and, you know, like experience and we were just so sick and tired of it. So we tried to sleep at friends' houses as much as we could or whatever. And I noticed that every time we went to a hotel though, for some reason, we were over our friend's house, it wouldn't happen. But if we went to a hotel or a motel, we'd get it there. If we went to my uncle's or aunt's, it would happen there, you know? And it was happening at home a lot. So hmm. yeah, it was, it was weird because the Ouija board was at my house. So I don't know if it was like following us 
Yeah, that could I be, don't, you know what, that, that could almost be like um, an authority type of thing because like if you're in a hotel or motel, you're technically in authority over that house. But if you go to a friend's house and let's say they're even just a little bit Christian, they're like, no, nah, I ain't going to, I don't want to, I can't go in there, you know? So that might have yeah. something to do with it. Yeah, that's true. And uh, it was strange because I've, what happened was we go through all of our life, pretty much until we were six, till we were 16 years old, 17, 18, we dealt with it quite often. But by the time we were, uh, by the time we were like 18 to 19, it, it was only happening every once in a while. We ended up moving from that house. And uh, when we were moving, I like took out the Ouija board out of the, out of the closet that I totally forgot was there. You know, I, I spent, a, it was like a, a long time before, since the last time we had played with it, like a couple of years. So anyways, I find it in the closet. I'm like, dude, I wonder if this is like what's going on. Cause now at this point, you know, 16, 17 years old, I'm, I'm more knowledgeable about things and we're already researching a bunch of stuff. And, we come across how the Ouija board is demonic and all that stuff. And I wasn't a Christian at the time, but I told my brother, it's like, I wonder if this has something to do with it, dude. Mm. So we ended up throwing it away and getting rid of it. Never saw it again. And uh, we moved to a, a new house when we were 16, we moved to the next town over. We ended up not having sleep paralysis as much. And, but every once in a while we, we would. And, um, but at that time we were kind of, we were smoking a lot. I don't know if that's okay to tell you, but you no, know what absolutely. I mean? Like, like you're smoking yeah, weed. We, we were smoking weed because we had such trouble sleeping. Yeah. So we got into that and it helped us sleep a lot, Yeah. you know? And uh, so I noticed that it would only happen every once in a while during that period. Well, while we were at this house, my brother and I, at this point, like, dude, we love documentaries. So, that's pretty much all we do is like watch documentaries and learn and gain as much knowledge as we could. And, and we're like, we, we know about the new world order and like all this stuff, you know what I mean? And we were, you know, 16 years old. And uh, I just remember the feeling like nobody else cared about it. It was like me and my brother. And then maybe somebody every 200 miles might, might know about it or care about it. And we were like super passionate about exposing this stuff, you know, because we just saw the connections and we're like, this is like serious. Why doesn't nobody care? You know? So I'm on Facebook and uh, this, this kid messages me and his name is Frankie and he doesn't mind if I say his name. So my buddy, Frank is a big part of my testimony. My buddy, Frankie texted me and he was like, Hey man, I know about the new world order too. And we got into this big conversation and it felt really good to like know somebody else who knew and understood what we were talking about. And uh, so I told him, I was like, hey, man, um, I was like, we should hang out sometime. You should come over. He ended up only living like 20 minutes away. And I don't remember meeting this kid a day in my life. But he comes over. He's like, yeah, dude, I remember playing baseball with you guys and, you know, this and that. So I guess we had played sports with him when we were growing up, too. But I just couldn't remember him. And uh, anyways, the, I asked him to come over the next week to hang out and chill. You know, maybe watch a documentary or something, talk about all this stuff, kind of get it off our chest. And um, before that weekend came, my brother and I had stumbled upon a documentary we were watching called, uh, uh, what's it called? Zeitgeist. Okay. You know that, yeah, a lot of people know what that is now, right? So at this point, we're not Christian yet, but we watch Zeitgeist. And it's telling us, oh, you know, the Bible's false and Jesus is really the sun in the sky and his 12 disciples are the 12 constellations and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, I, knew, I never read the Bible a day in my life, you know? And uh, I just remember that making a lot of sense to me. And so I didn't really, like, I believed in a higher power, but I didn't believe in the, the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, <laughs> my buddy comes over the next week and he's like, hey, man, do you want to watch a documentary? And I was like, yeah, definitely. And he puts on this, so my brother and I are kicking it with him. And uh, he puts on this documentary called um, Age, of Deceit, Age of Deceit by uh, Face Like the Sun on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, Gon Samora, that's his, he's a big truther guy. He's, he's a Christian, right? But uh, he puts on this documentary and we were loving it because at the beginning it talks about the New World Order and all this stuff is from a biblical point of view. 
uh, this documentary is so it's like got scripture and it's got this and that and i'm like oh this is pretty convincing but you know i had, i had just learned that jesus was the son of the sky so i was kind of like didn't know what to make about it but halfway through this movie the movie itself brings up zeitgeist in it and completely debunks the claims by zeitgeist because you know the bible says thou shalt not worship the sun the moon and the stars you know and i'm thinking to myself like well if jesus is the sun in the sky the bible is written by god why why is it contradicting itself then you know what i mean kind of like like he can't be the sun in the sky because he strictly commands us not to worship the sun the moon and the stars you know what i mean so we're watching this documentary we're getting sucked in at this point and at the very end and and it literally brought up aliens and uh i don't remember i had a sleep paralysis thing but it talked about aliens uh zeitgeist new world order and all these other subjects the new age movement all the stuff that my brother and i from the time we were 13 to to 19 were like in like stuck in you know we went down all these paths at one point and um but it ended up so and i knew it was god because it brought up everything that my brother and i had ever been involved with and then at the end of and exposed it and at the end of that documentary it preached the gospel and my brother and I, we could not refuse what we had just learned and saw. And we just started crying, dude, on the spot. Like it, like our heart instantly, like God revealed his truth to us in that moment. And my brother and I, that night, just freaking, sorry, but just broke down crying and gave our lives to Jesus that night together in our bedroom after watching all that. And it seemed like it was the moment we got saved I could see where God was from the time I was born, like in my life, like working in my life from the time I was born to that to that moment. How many times I should have died, how many times God must have saved me from this and that, you know what I mean? And it just all connected and I just, ever since that day, my brother and I completely sold out for Jesus and gave our lives to him and went on to do kind of like what the documentary did, you know, we uh, exposed the new world order and you know entities and sleep paralysis and all this other stuff and we're way more knowledgeable than we were back then but you know that's kind of been our road so far in the last so that was like 10 years ago you know how, how many years ago was that i was saved when i was 19 so about 10 years ago about 10 years ago wow man that yeah. that is such a cool cool testimony man like i'm i'm sure uh gons shimura dude i mean like to to be able to know that your documentary is like literally taking part in that that's got to be that's just that's totally a god thing man i love that i had to reach out to him dude i was like dude you don't how you don't even know how much fruit you're probably producing and i was like you say my through your documentary you know god revealed himself to us and it saved our lives dude you know what i mean i'm just and I'm very thankful for that but yeah, there's, there's got to be, there's lots of people who end up coming to Christ through that type of knowledge. Do you know what I mean? Like learning about this stuff, because a lot of people know about the New World Order. They know about this and that, and they don't connect it to the Bible at all. So like the last piece of the puzzle is connecting it to the Bible and knowing that Jesus Christ is real, Satan runs the world. You know what I mean? All these things are interconnected and it's all comes from the Bible. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you, you saw, so you got, you get carried out of a room by some entity, prays you around the house. You, you're coming down the stairs another night and you literally see Satan himself sitting there. Are you, are you, is it safe to say that that's directly connected to you and your brother using the Ouija board? Uh, I think that using the Ouija board was a part of it, but like I said, said we were so mad at god and we were like super angry kids you know what i mean like we thought we were good people but we lived a hellish life so i think that the ouija board was a portal but also the way that we were living gave a foothold to him yeah as well you know what i mean and allowed all these things to happen i'm sure there's more that you know after the show i'm gonna be like oh man i forgot to tell you this or that but there was quite a few quite a few instances where um we either saw an entity or physically were t like picked up or, right. you know, or felt a physical 
presence. Yeah. Dude, that's, yeah, that's crazy. So I went, I went through a period, um, and maybe you'd have insight on this. I'm just not, there's nothing, there's no really story out of it, but I went through a period where I got hooked on the Ouija board and I was like, uh, it's probably like 16 or 17. And I was like, I was a total stoner drug addict, but my friend and I, um, we got, we started doing the Ouija board and the weed dude, it would get so mad at me and it would start like answering the questions right? But then all of a sudden it would flip and it would like so much force and it would go back between, it would say N Z N Z It's like super, super fast until it basically like flew off the board, but it would get so mad at me. And I couldn't really, I mean, it would start off and we'd ask questions like, Oh, who's my wife going to be? And all this stuff, the stupid, you know, teenager stuff. But then for some reason, right. whatever entity was behind it, it would get so, so upset at me. And then it wouldn't work for like a couple hours. And then we tried again and then it would start to work and then get mad at me. It was crazy. But, you know, at, at that time in my life, like I knew because my mom was a Christian and I, you know, I always knew there was a God, but I didn't walk that way. But I always knew like once it started to get crazy, I knew just to say in the name of Jesus, stop. And maybe that's what it was is they didn't, they knew that, you know, our house was, you know, a God house, but, but yeah, man. So what would you say? I mean, cause there's a lot of kids out there right now, dude, like, and I see it online and I see, and when I like the younger generation, I mean, even I'm a little bit older than you probably, but you know, um, and I hear, I see a lot of the language, even like on TikTok and stuff, when it comes to the paranormal stuff is that these kids know something's up, you know what I'm saying? They know that there's more than just the physical realm. I mean, what, what would your message be to like, to those kids out there that are messing around and dabbling with this stuff? Honestly, I would I give them strong caution not to even not even to mess with it like if you want because the issue is is that people are seeking something more than what's around us you know nine to five uh, you know just the physical world around us they know in their heart that there's something more and they're seeking that and i went down that road to seek something more than to my than myself you know what i mean something spiritual and those roads that you go on you can find your spiritual and I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not trying to say that you're everybody's going to have a spiritual experience when they get saved. But if you're looking for something supernatural and you're looking for the truth in your life and that there's something more, you need to go to the Bible because once you understand and study the word of God, you'll see how supernatural it is. Like you got Nephilim, you know, you got the witch of Endor, you know, you got all these different things. Jesus uh, casting out demons. Like there's obviously that spiritual connection that I think that we have all in us. So that the, the spiritual answer, I would say, is, is found in the word and in Jesus Christ, you know? Yeah. And all these other things, if you look at where the Ouija board came from and the, the, the makers of it, you know, their whole goal, uh, like I read a long time ago, their whole goal was to literally like get a portal into the hands of people and kids to allow entities to come through. Like they knew what they were doing when they made it. You know what I mean? Now I'm pretty sure it was started by a, a Freemason as well. Like one of the creators of the boards was started by a Freemason, you know? So, so I would say, you know, ditch all that stuff. If you want to know the truth and you want to experience something or, or have the knowledge of it, like you go to the Bible and I'm telling you, as you become a Christian, you're going to experience spiritual things in your life. Anyway, God's going to give you those eyes to see, you're going to know, that you're in a war now and you know what i mean like you got to choose what side you really want to be on so yeah amen so let's talk about let's talk about these entities real quick um because you you have experience in the sleep paralysis and action and, and tangibly feeling these entities around you i mean are they are they demons are they fallen angels what what's your your take on who they are and how they're able to, i mean again i know we kind of already touched on it but how they're able to access the person because um there's actually a guy and i'm i'm trying I'm working on something with this but there's a guy um he's one of the new age teachers out there that that talks about contacting aliens but he doesn't call them aliens he calls them gods and he says in his book 
his, this is Whitley Strieber I'm talking about. And he, and he says in his book that for some reason, people who have been through trauma can access these beings a lot easier. And he himself has been through trauma and he contacts these entities and he says they're good. So what's your take on that? Just from your experience and what you've been through. Oh, well, my, my take personally is that, that they're demons, you know, um, demons are, are disembodied spirits, you know? So, and, and like, like if it was a fallen angel, I feel like it would have a little more, uh, uh, physicality to it almost, you know what I mean? And, and that says, so, so I, I really take that they're demons and the fact that you feel immense, like the most overwhelming sense of fear and that you have to be paralyzed to even contact or have a, some, for them to even like have a contact with you, is kind of like a red flag. You know what I mean? Like if they weren't demons, you would think that they would be like, Oh, Hey man, like I'm here, you know, and, and they're looking you know, nice and, you know, not scaring you or whatever, or, or doing things that are like, be, that are beyond your control, you know, and against your will. Like I, to me, they're just demons. And, uh, the thing is though, is in, and part of the story I forgot to tell you is when I came to Christ and I was dealing with this, right. Um, for a long time after I came to Christ, it stopped. And there's an importance of, uh, realizing that when, if you want to be protected by God, you also have to be walking in the way, in the way that he called you to walk. Because I remember kind of like backsliding a little bit and not really focusing and doing what I was supposed to do for God. And I would start getting sleep paralysis again. And uh, the very first time that I did after I got saved, I was able to stop it immediately. So my whole life, I could never stop sleep paralysis. It just took me over. I gave up, gave in. And then I'd wake up, you know, and be like, dang. But like when I came to Christ, the time that I did have sleep paralysis and I couldn't speak, I couldn't talk, I couldn't yell for help, I couldn't say the name of Jesus out loud. And in my head, I'm sitting there, I'm laying down in my bed, my door's shut. In my head, I say, in the name of Jesus, I command you to get to, to leave me alone and get out of here and to be gone, right? And I snapped out of it immediately when I called on the name of Jesus. And my, my bedroom door swung open. It just swung open. It was shut. And I could see it when I woke up. Like, my, my door was moving like this, slowly opening. Like, it just left. Huh. I, I love that, man. So, what would you say to people out there that are on the fence right now? Like, they, oh, I, you know, I deal with sleep paralysis, but I, I, don't, I don't believe in Jesus. Like, what would you tell that person? Because I know a lot of people deal with this. They don't like it. They want it to go away. And really, Jesus is the cure. But what, what's your message to that person? Well, if you want to suffer, it for, suffer with it for the rest of your life, then sure, ignore Jesus. But you hear all these testimonies, guys, that Jesus' name literally stops these things. They even stop alien abductions. Like, you know what I mean? And, and it's his name. And there's something to that. So you, it, if you don't believe in him, that's kind of like that's your your right not to believe but i guarantee you if you try it if you're suffering one night and you call out to his name mm. and you try it and it will work it will set you free then you need to double you need to like reevaluate everything you know and you need to real about reevaluate your life and repent and believe in the in in jesus christ the son of god because you can't say Buddha and it will stop. You can't say Muhammad and it will stop. It's only the name of Jesus that it will stop. And that shows like the Bible says that he has powers over dominions, over principalities and everything else. Everything is subject to him. And when you experience that, you're going to know. Yeah. You know, so you need to, if you do it, if you're, if you're suffering one night, call out to his name. Yeah. And if he does it for you, you owe that to him to, to repent and to believe in him because he wants you. He doesn't want the devil to have your soul. You know, he wants to have your soul. He's your creator and he loves you and he died for you and he rose again for you. And he did this all for you, you know? So that's what I would say. No, that's, that's, that's great, man. In uh, Deuteronomy ten seventeen, it says that God is the God above all gods. There's other entities out there, but he is the God that's above them. 
And then through Jesus Christ, as you mentioned, because he's got the dominion over the powers and principalities, but we're sitting in the heavenly places next to him. And so when we're saying the name of Jesus, we're invoking the all the power of the kingdom of heaven. And if that isn't empowering to somebody out there who's dealing with this that doesn't believe, at least, that's what I say, at least consider it. Give it a try because this is the real the, the reality that we live in isn't what they've been telling us it is. Yeah, man. Uh, it, it's funny you bring that up because, uh, you know, I watched this documentary that used to be on Netflix and it was about sleep paralysis. I don't remember the exact name and I don't think it's on Netflix anymore, but it was, uh, it was a secular documentary uh, interviewing all these people who had sleep paralysis. Well, there was two stories. And, and after watching that, I'm like, oh, you know, some people had it way worse than I did. Like some of their stories are just crazy. But um, there was two stories in there. Remember, this is a secular documentary. One of them suffered with sleep paralysis their whole life and gave their lives to Christ and was able to use his name. And it stopped. Right. And she she well, she gave her life to Christ after that time, after that moment. And uh, and she was set free ever since, as far as I know. But um, and then there was another guy who was dealing with it really, really bad, having all these intense and crazy, vivid uh, nightmares and sleep and entities, seeing entities at the end of his bed. And one night he called out to God, and for the first time in his life, it stopped. Right? And I'm like, oh, that happened to me. But he never gave his life to Christ, and so he still suffers with it. And I'm sitting there like if anybody's watching this documentary and they see the contrast between those two people and the rest of them, you know, yeah. like you can tell like right here is telling you the name of Jesus works and it's the only thing that works. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that that right there, I think, is um, it's the is the biggest and most provable point when it comes to all of this stuff. I mean, the the whole world is trying to debunk Christianity and saying how Christianity is a false religion and gives the the whole analysis on it. But then when it comes to this stuff, because like you said, it's not the name of Buddha that stops it. It's not the name of Muhammad. It's, it's the name of Jesus. And so what this tells me, ma'am, is that somebody's been lying to us, but like, you know, the world that we live in isn't, isn't the way that they've been telling us, you know? And then when you, I've, I went through that down the same roads of paranormal stuff and all of that stuff. But when you are a truth seeker, when you're, when you are literally looking for truth and you're not just trying to conjure up experiences Jesus is always, I always tell people, Jesus is at the end of that path of truth and he's waiting for you, man. And it's like, there's so much freedom. So let me say this, just so we can touch on this. Like, how is like your walk or your life after all of this with Jesus? I mean, I, I know it's not like you're floating around on a cloud. I mean, life can still be tough, but you have Jesus now. Well, you know, ever since I gave my life to him, I realized I know I felt like this urgency and this urgency in me to like, to really live as I should be living, you know, according to God's word. Like I was, especially when I first got saved, man, I was eating up the word of God. Like I was every day, you know what I mean? I was really soaking my, my, my life, my time, everything into the word of God. And uh, there were some points where it got really rough. Like the closer I got to God, at the beginning, the uh, the more that I felt like I was getting attacked or going through something or things were going wrong and like all this stuff. And I was just like, oh, man, you know, this isn't what everybody told me it was going to be, you know, because people tell you, like you said, you're riding the clouds, everything's all good and dandy. And it wasn't. And uh, and I had known that through the word, but it got real to me when things really got bad, you know, and um there was obviously we all have seasons, right? We all have seasons of going through stuff, you know, and sometimes it feels like that season is more than a season. It's like all four seasons, you know what I mean? You're dealing with it for a long time. Um, but if you really look at other people or you look at like the parable of the sower, right? 
it says that let's, they, they receive the word with gladness, right? And uh, they, they continued for a little while. And then when trouble arose, they pretty much got choked out and they, they left, right? So I know, and, and in the word of God, it talks about apostasy. And I always told myself that whenever I'm going through something, I don't want to be another, I don't want to be a part of that prophecy. Like I don't want to be a statistic in the apostasy, or I don't want to be that part uh, where I'm continuing. And then when hard times come, you know, that I get choked out because I know the end result. Yeah. You know, I know people want to debate once saved, always saved, but to me, it's clear that you need to continue in a, in a loving, obedient relationship to Christ, no matter what comes your way. And you got to realize that the things that happen in your life are meant to refine your faith. They're supposed to build your character and get you to lean and trust on him. Right. Because when everything is going well, you seem and tend to start fading away a little while for, uh, you know, a little bit because there's nothing there pushing you towards God. Does that make sense? Dude, no, you know? that's, that is, that's beautiful, man. Because, you know, I, I, um, I spent a, uh, the first six or seven months of my Christian walk, I was going to a prosperity gospel type of church and I, they had me brainwashed, bro. And when I was coming out of that, that indoctrination, God said this to me. He says, look, dude, he says, your faith isn't in the yes and no's of the prayers that you're, you're asking me for, because that was their, that was their bottom line. You're, if you pray for it, then you should get it. Now, that's not true. But he said, right. your faith is, is not in the yes and no's. It's in the even those, like, even though I'm going through this season of lack or discouragement or whatever it may be, even though, are you going to stand for, for me, Christ in that, in that, in those moments, because we're not promised everything's going to be okay. But that it's so beautiful the way you said it though, man. Yeah. Um, you know, Ephesians six really was probably a favorite verse of all time. You know, Ephesians six twelve. You know that whole thing mm -hmm. um, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You know what I mean? Uh, when you already know about the new world order and you're a Christian, you know what I mean? Like that that Bible verse kind of stands out to you anyway. You know, you're like, oh yeah, we're not wrestling. You know, all these people worship Satan and they're running the world, and you know, uh, so if the devil is real, then and they have all this power, then so is God. You got to decide. You know what I mean? So like. To me, that verse and many other verses have were always stuck with me to remind me that whatever I'm going through, I know that it's not always flesh and blood. You know what I mean? That I know that some things are spiritual. Let me let me ask you this, and then we can we can wrap up here. What do you see? Here you are, you 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 went through this amazing testimony, came to Jesus, and not only came to Jesus, but really really came to this place to where you know how to walk with him and obey him. You know, of course, there's ups and downs and whatnot, but what do you see coming for this world? And so this is just me giving, giving you the opportunity to share your heart for what is happening in our world right now. You know, uh, I think that as the Bible says, things are just going to get worse and worse and worse. And uh, honestly, that sounds like dreadful, but we don't deserve the peace in this world that we think that we do because this world is so wicked. Like, does that make sense? Like America does not deserve a president that's going to prosper the United States because of all the abortion and all the things that we legalize and promote and do that are against God. You know what I mean? But it's not only the United States that is doing this. The whole world is like really doing this. It's there are all the heathen gathered together in rage against God, you know? And, um, I just see things getting worse and worse and worse because God doesn't, I, I believe that God doesn't want to tolerate the way this world is and the sin of it and the abominations that mankind is committing. Um, you know, so I believe that it's going to get worse and God is going to allow prophecy to be fulfilled. The new world order, I believe is going to be coming in pretty soon here. I think, uh, you know, the world economic forum, makes it pretty clear that that's what you know 
and uh, this, this new proxy war and everything is just leading to the world fighting a boogeyman and somehow coming together yeah. to, uh, to create this new world order. And there's many different facets, facets of that, you know, this false alien invasion or whatever. There's so many different um, ways that all this could come about. And um, I think that the church in itself is, man, I can see that the church, especially during COVID, is, is not where they need to be in Christ at all. You know, and the weak and the terrorists are truly being separated. You can see clearly who's dedicated and who's not dedicated. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, it's through tragedy and events, like whoever stands up for God and his word during these things, y'all, you know that he, you know, that he's for him, but you got these churches that are like, oh, you need to take the vaccine. You need to shut down. We don't need to gather, even though God commanded, commands us to not forsake the, the uh, coming together of the saints, you know? And uh, all this stuff. So it shows the wheats and the tares. And I believe that things are going to get even worse and people are going to be more exposed. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I want to say that there is hope in that because if we're still going through this stuff, you still have time to repent. You know what I mean? You still have time to really get into his word, start living your life because every day that you're breathing until Christ returns is a point of uh you know like it's a blessing for you to be able to get your life right with him sanctification process is, is a process it's like you're working on things all the time but if you're sitting on the sidelines you're gonna get deceived by the uh by the uh great deception you know like you're gonna get deceived by it because you don't even know the word you don't even know what's coming you just profess christ with your lips you know what i mean yeah. and for us for those who are truly in Christ need to go out there and get more disciples and need to do what we need to do for Christ. We need to gather more people into his kingdom because really there's a war against two kingdoms. That's what it is. And one kingdom has all these sets of rules that they follow. And that's the world. That's the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of darkness. And Christ's kingdom has his own set of rules, his own laws that we go by. You know what I mean? And once you get somebody out of this kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light, that person is going to be another beacon for God to use to gather more people, you know, and God wants to save as many people as he can. And he uses tragedy and all these events and calamities and all this stuff for mankind to run to him. That's what I believe. Like, look how many times that God in the Old Testament allowed Israel to go through all this stuff, man, like gave him so many times to repent. You know, it was very patient with them, but he let calamities happen and they would repent and they would do the, you know, be faithful to God for a little bit. And then they would go off and worship another God eventually, you know, and it kept happening and happening. But that's the same way that it seems that some people in the church are. And unless something truly bad happens, I know for a fact that you cannot sometimes through human pride, you need to come to the end of yourself through tragedy or something that God allows in your, in your mm -hmm. life to break you down for you to truly rely and put your faith in God. And I think that that's going to come in a worldwide scale. I think the end times is going to be way worse than people really can imagine. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, that's a great, that's a great point because right now this is, um, this, this is almost like the dress for the, the dress rehearsal for what's to come. And, you know, as you said, you know, we, we still have that opportunity to say, oh, oh, crap, this is this is coming. You know, we got to turn our life around. Yeah, I think that it's important too, to know that, like God says that people's hearts are going to fail them for what's to come up on the earth. That means it's going to be really, really bad. You know what I mean? Like people's hearts are going to fail them and love is going to grow cold. I, I think that if you can soak up that verse, if you can soak up that meaning and that reality that that stuff is about to happen. And you don't have to let yourself become one of those people. You know what I mean? If you know what's going to happen, then don't let your heart get cold. That's don't cool. let your uh, love grow cold. You know what I mean? And no matter what we're going through, that just know that God already told us. And he told us, he commanded us not to be afraid. As hard as that may be sometimes, we're not supposed to be afraid of anything that's coming up on the air. Yeah. You, you know, so I think that we really need to take it seriously and absorb it like a sponge. 
Don't become another statistic and a prophecy, man. You know what I mean? Don't let your heart grow, go grow cold, your love grow cold. And uh, don't become a part of the apostasy. You know, don't be that seed that lands on stony ground. Like, you really need to, because you're in control of that. You know what I mean? You know yourself. You know what your heart is like. And I know that we all know that our hearts are wicked and deceitful. But if you know that, and as trouble comes, you don't have to let that trouble destroy you. You know what I mean? You have to build your house on that on that rock. Yeah, that's that's so good, man. On behalf of myself and Jeremy Stone, we would like to thank you for watching. If you deal with sleep paralysis or any other type of spiritual attack, we encourage you to call on the name that is above every single name, Jesus Christ. In the meantime, check out one of these other videos. Until next time, go forth and bear some fruit.